the cool stuff if you're a member. And plus, you're supporting a really cool place. Um, I also want to thank our sponsors, uh, Century Bank of Cartersville and also uh, uh, Courtyard Marriott of Cartersville for their generous support for this lecture series. And I uh, want to let you know that in August, uh, continuing with our exciting events here at TELUS, um, we have uh, on August 21st, it's a Saturday, if you're into fossils, uh, we have fossil mania going on that day. And we'll have uh, some of the local fossil groups bringing in fossils. You can ha get some free fossils. You can look at fossils and handle them and all sorts of cool stuff like that. Uh, on August 11th, uh, we have online our Ask the Experts series. We, we broadcast on our YouTube and also Facebook uh, platforms, and you can see it later. It's recorded on our website. Uh, but we have uh, Dr. Bill Cook out of Huntsville, who is an expert on meteors. And the reason I brought him on is because the Perseid meteor shower um, happens uh, around that time, around August 11th, from about 10th to the 14th. And that is a wonderful uh, thing this year because the moon won't be around. So all you have to do is go out. You just need clear weather, which, uh, well, in August you never know. Uh, you could ask Glenn for a, a meteor prediction on that. And, uh, and then on the 18th, uh, we have Ryan Rooney, uh, Rooney who's our uh, geologist. And he'll be talking about paleontology for our Lunch and Learn on August 18th. So you can come back here and enjoy lunch and learn with him. By the way, I'm David Dundee. I'm Director of Education, also the astronomer here, and uh, having a great time because I get to introduce my good friend, Glenn Burns. Glenn Burns and I have known each other for, is it 38 years, yep. 40 years? Goodness, we were only five at the time. But, uh, <laughs> but I've known Glenn for a very, very long time. Glenn uh, has always had a big heart and very generous to uh, institutions in our area. And at the time, I was the astronomer at Fernbank Science Center in Atlanta. And Glenn was generous enough to come in often to be one of my voices uh, for when we were producing planetarium shows down there. So Glenn was always very, very helpful in that. And uh, Glenn and I have had some adventures. Uh, we've, we've chased a solar eclipse back in, a, 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 in a August of uh, two th uh, 2017 up to, to South Carolina. And uh, we've had some other interesting adventures as well. Um, so it's really a great honor to, to introduce the chief meteorologist for WSB-TV, Glenn Burns. Thank you. Thank you. And before I, I let Glenn get into it, last week was Glenn's birthday. So we have got a cake, which we're cutting up busily into very small pieces for everybody. But uh, <laughs> uh, my, my volunteers are bringing it out, and uh, they, they'll be, be on little plates, and we'll be passing them out uh, as Glenn talks. So happy birthday, Glenn. Thank you. Thank you. And, and if you wouldn't mind, this gentleman here has done an outstanding job for this museum for a long time. Give Dave, Dave a, a hand. He's just amazing. amazing. Well, I am the chief meteorologist for WSB-TV in Atlanta, and uh, I've had a great interest, as they pointed out, in space as well. So my postgraduate work from school was meteorology, but also in astrophysics. And what got me interested in astrophysics was a friend of mine. His name is Al Warden. And it coincides with this date, because he was a very good friend of mine. And in 1971, he went to the moon. He went to the moon. I know an astronaut that went to the moon. So uh, he gave me a big surprise for my birthday. On his way back from the moon to Earth, he climbed out of his space capsule and he took a picture of the Earth for me and signed it. I got that in my wall at home. So in the middle between the Earth and the moon, he climbs out and takes a picture for me of the Earth. How many people have that? <laughs> 
So yeah, I'm the chief meteorologist and I love weather and I've done a lot of forecasting over the last four decades here in Atlanta. Uh, tornado chasing, hurricanes, all of the above. I've flown into the eye of hurricanes on the Air Force Hurricane Hunter aircraft. I chased storms out in the Great Plains with a guy named Reed Timmer. I don't know if you ever heard of Reed Timmer. He was on storm chasers. He's not well. He's not a well man. He gets way too close, <laughs> way too close. But again, I love weather. It's each, each day is new and exciting. And you know, I'm on for at a time three minutes. And you say, oh, that's not a long time. You have an easy day, right? Well, one minute is about one hour's worth of work. So I thought what I'd do today is take you kind of behind the curtain, so to speak, and to show you exactly what my day is like for the most part. Now yesterday I did this and unfortunately I was holding my iPad the wrong way so it's kind of a, a, a squishy thing but nevertheless you'll get the idea about it. So how we begin my day, uh, where's Elise? Just want to make sure I'm doing this the correct way. Let's see, apparently not. Elise, where are you? All right, so we'll get it. All right, here we go. So when I come in from the, uh, the parking deck, let me see if I can't get this. No, apparently not. I'm getting this. I generally arrive here at the station about 1.30 in the afternoon, and I go right through these doors. This is one of three studios we have here at WSB-TV. This is our new studio, and you can see we have a lot of lights out here. I don't even want to mention what our lighting bill is every month. But these are the studio cameras. We have five of them. There's our new set. And over here, this is our green screen. Right here, I stand in front of this each and every day and we can put anything we want in that green wall. It'll come up as radar or computer graphics, but you never ever see the green screen. It's called chroma key, and it's a process in which we can take pictures and actually put them into the green screen. And there's the camera that shoots me every day. Over here, this is called the L wall. And you know why it's called the L wall? Because it's on the left side of the studio. And in that L wall, that bank of monitors, we can put our radar, or we can put all kinds of computer graphics. Now, I want you to meet Maya May. She is my producer here I'm at WSB. Oh, hello. Hi, hello. Maya. Hello. How's your day? Oh, it's going great. Very good. So Maya's job <laughs> each and every day is to do what? Make graphics. That is the main part of my job. Um, I also track storms. Uh, when the opportunity presents itself. But yeah, primarily what I do is just make graphics for all of our afternoon shows. So what is this machine here? Um, this is our Max machine. So this is our graphics program. Um, this is where I make all the graphics that you guys see on TV. It's where you draw the fronts and look at the yeah. radar and we look at the computer models too, right? Yes, yes. All of our models are in this program. So. For example, this is tonight's forecast. Um, and we just go right over here. We have all of the different models that we can choose from to, to look at and decide, okay, is this right or is this wrong? You're probably wondering how we figure out which is right and which is wrong. Well, yeah. what do we do, Maya? <laughs> well, we compare it to what's currently happening. Um, so this is our current radar right now. Um, we have some near or down near LaGrange. So what I would do to see which model is initializing, that's what we call it, initializing. So I'm going to pause it here because we use computer models each and every day. And you know who has the best computer model of all for the United States? The Europeans. Europeans. The ECMWF model is what we use primarily. It's the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting. The United States has the Global Forecast Systems model called a GFS, 
and it's actually the worst one we have. And I know, I know. But it's the private companies that are all coming out with computer models, and it's breaking down the atmosphere into numbers. And it's really a challenge. So what we do is we look at the radar, and then we look at the computer model that's closest to that radar picture. Then we know there's some accuracy in it, and then we can kind of say, yeah, here's where the storms are. Now here's where they're going to go. And yesterday, the European model did an outstanding job on the storms that were occurring across Atlanta and northern Georgia. Uh, we were getting hit extremely hard yesterday. We had two severe thunderstorm warnings. We had 60 mile per hour winds. We had nearly continuous cloud to ground lightning strokes. And I'll explain more about that right now here. But let's take a look further on here. I think best is I would put the time to the current time or close to it and see which model is closest to what's on our radar. So this is the graph. It's pretty overdone. The RPM is way underdone. These are computer models we're talking about. And her is probably looking. Yeah, I tell you what, it's really difficult this time of the year when you don't have cold fronts and warm fronts and very dynamic weather and just pop up afternoon thunderstorms for a model to really initialize well, right? Yeah, yeah, this is the challenge every day in the summertime. Right. So I usually partner with Glenn to see which model we're going to go with for uh, the evening and tomorrow and even our extended forecast. All right, so. I'm going to take you over here to our command center it's called and this is our storm tracker 2 hd radar you see when we have rain showers or thunderstorms each and every night on our weather and this is the control panel and we have all kinds of parameters here there's something called base velocity where we can peer inside a thunderstorm and see which way the wind is going that's really helpful in determining where tornadoes are and of course you can see hail and all kinds of things reflectivity is what we see every day and that's what reflectivity looks like there we have hail and all kinds of parameters here that we can use uh, to determine whether the storm is severe what's inside of it what's going on with it and it's really really helpful we're coming out of our studio right now walking down the hall here and we will enter shortly into the so um what we saw there was maya may and you will see her if you watch public broadcasting she's a meteorologist and she's doing a great series on, on climate change for public broadcasting and PBS. So I'll look for her, and I think she does a really outstanding job with that, and she's just a terrific producer here for us at, at WSB. All right, now each and every afternoon, I come into the Weather Center, look at the models, look at the radar, figure a little bit about what's going on, but not totally, and then I go into the newsroom and I tell everybody, what's going to happen or what I think is going to happen. And if there's any chance at all that they can lead with the weather, they're going to do it. Weather is impacting everybody, and it's great to have as the number one lead-in to a newscast. It's a very, very important part of our day. So this is a little bit about what you're going to see. This is our newsroom and what we do when we come into that. We're coming out of our studio right now, we're walking down the hall here, and we will enter shortly into the newsroom. So we have lots of hallways here, and you can see the station is very large. Also a lot of pictures on the wall here. Here's what I used to look like when I first started here at WSB-TV. <laughs> what a youngster. All right, this is our newsroom right here. And as you can see, it is extremely large. Lots of people usually work here, but in times of COVID, that has all changed. So every day at two o'clock, I walk into the newsroom here, and we have our two o'clock meeting. So I'll be meeting with the producers of each show. This is Marcus here. He produces our 6 p.m. Hello, how are you? Over here is Josh. He produces our 5 p.m. show. Hello. There's Joe, he does our 11s. And uh, this is where it all happens right here. So this is the area where all the producers and writers usually sit and that produce the newscast. Over here, this is where the assignment desk is. And these are where all the uh, police reports are coming in and what we see across the air. Uh, as far as news stories go, we get a lot of this and these people up here guide the reporters to where they're supposed to be. 
All right, this is Amanda. She's producing our four o'clock show today. And Amanda, how important is weather in our newscast? So weather's really important. It impacts everyone, if you think about it. Even if it's sunny and hot outside, you're going to need to know that it's sunny and hot. But we're talking about dangerous storms that come through. You might be an allergy sufferer. That's a part of weather. Everything is right now. We're talking air pollution, um, quality. If you have like asthma and stuff, you need to know that that's an issue. So um, it's a lot more than just rain, but for example, today we're expecting thunderstorms. They're not gonna be everywhere, but they're gonna be impacting some communities. And then you wanna know also if you're next in line. Um, if it's severe weather, it's very dangerous. You wanna get a heads up to protect your family or to even just get inside or maybe change plans. Um, Glenn and severe weather team two is, you know, they're on top of that. They're the first line of defense and they work with us to make sure that we can get on TV quickly and warn people as fast as possible. When we have days of tornado warnings and severe thunderstorm warnings, what's your day like here trying to produce that kind of a show? Well, it's crazy. <laughs> um, no, but we, I mean, obviously we have a little bit of a heads up because, you know, we have the meteorologists telling us, you know, expect a big day tomorrow. We should have a plan in place. So we do. Um, but if a tornado warning pops, then we get on TV right away. If it's a thunderstorm warning, sometimes TV or and or your mobile device, which, you know, almost everybody has now. Um, so then we kind of juggle our day and we just get on TV and we warn people and then in the aftermath of that we might send out crews to show you live pictures of what happened and um, tell stories of people who wrote out the storm. So not only so they can share their stories but also so people know what kind of damage is done by those kinds of storms and you should take cover. And we're frequently guiding our reporters to the, to the areas where we're seeing severe storms and having a big impact, right? Yeah, so we're getting the reporters out there to get the story but also um, Glenn and the other meteorologists will work with us to make sure the reporters aren't in like a bad position either to, you know, potentially be in like a storm's path or, um, we don't want anybody getting hurt. Stay safe. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you. This is one of three control rooms we have here at WSB TV. This is kind of the, now this, I don't have a clue about. This is a control room here. There are more monitors than Best Buy uh, would ever think about. And we have one guy that knows everything about all of those. His name is Nate. He's the director of the show. He's like the orchestra leader. He's, he's, he's out there saying, take camera one, put up that shot, put up this tower cam. He, for two hours at a time, he is just unbelievable. The, the pressure on this guy, because it's all live, is, is staggering here. So that's going to show you a little bit about the control room here. And uh, inner workings of our uh, news area. And this is behind the scenes here. And you can see all these monitors, and these are different sources of video that we use, including our Storm Tracker 2 HD radar. And the guy that knows everything about this is our director, Nate. How, How are you doing, Nate? Good. How are you? Good. Tell us a little bit about what you do and, and uh, all of this stuff that you have here. It looks pretty impressive. So starting over here, we have robotic cameras. Those are out in the studio. They move on their own for predetermined uh, stations that we save. And then we have at night, which is how we direct. So when Glenn comes running in and tells us there's an emergency and we need to go in the air, there's severe weather, there's flooding, there's something coming our way or either here already, we, we punch them up get him on the air and once he starts he can pinpoint where the danger is and then we can we can try to track the danger on tower cams and try to find the flooding or the tornadoes or the severe thunderstorms and then Glenn guides us to safety on days when we have really uh, bad weather like tornado so Nate, Nate does a great job because yesterday uh, we have a slew of tower cams across Metro Atlanta so he's actually listening to me going, well, the storm is coming through Bartow County, moving toward Cherokee County, and he will actually find the tower cam that, that corresponds to what I'm talking about and punch it up. And I never know that that's going to happen, really, but I appreciate it when it does. And so we're kind of like in sync here is what we want to see. So I'm showing you the storms on radar, but when you see them out there, the dark clouds and the lightning going on makes a little bit better impression, right? You're, you're more apt to take cover 
so to speak. Oh, it's a green blob, but when you see the dark sky and this low-hanging cloud and the relentless lightning, you're more apt to take cover when you actually see the storm. So that's kind of a reinforcement we do. So he does a great job, along with our technical directors, uh, to, to listen, actually. Uh, a lot of directors don't listen, but, but, but Nate does, and he does a superb job. Warnings run continuously. What kind of a challenge is that? The challenge is trying to find out exactly where the threat is and showing the threat. Glenn already knows where the threat is, but then it's our job to try to sim crews to try to make sure they they can get an eye on it and, and show what's going on at that particular time. All right, what time of, uh, oh, let's see, that's good. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so what we just did is prepared a radar sequence, and that's with my little clicker here so I can advance through the different frames to show you what's going on with radar. And I was just checking out these storms. Now, these are unbelievable storms here. And now, this was before things, everything hour, exploded two, an hour later. Is the ability to detect lightning. So these are the lightning strikes in this view. Check this out. 322 lightning strikes. That's in the last 10 minutes. 12 of those are the positive lightning strikes. They leap out of the top of the thunderstorm cloud, a billion volts of electricity and 300,000 amps. They are deadly. And the reason they're so deadly, but well, one of the reasons is they can travel at least 25 miles from the parent thunderstorm. So, these so this is important. And, and I want to make this clear here about our detection of lightning. When we see lightning out there, we see those positive lightning strikes. Uh, I know that there might be a boater out on Lake Lanier, it's, the sun is shining, and there might be a storm 20, 25 miles away. And we've seen lightning strike that far away from a storm. So again, you need to be weather aware this time of the year, especially uh, in July, which is our lightning month here in North Georgia, that these storms are capable of producing lightning a great distance away. There are some ferocious thunderstorms <coughs> across parts of eastern Alabama into our viewing area. So again, really impressive. And one of the other things that happens here, we get rain-cooled air. And this rain-cooled air sets up a little boundary, like a little mini cold front. And that's what this is right here. So arc here. So that's kind of like a mini cold front as it drives westward here into our southern metro Atlanta area this afternoon. This can actually act like a little cold front and generate even more thunderstorms across the area. So something will be watching. So that, that again, that you're seeing, that little green band there, see that it comes out of Noonan, that little like a bow and arrow shaped thing? Uh, that is an outflow boundary. That is when a thunderstorm starts dropping rain, that rain is coming up from way high up in the cloud. It's very cold. And that rain hits the ground and that cold air kind of fans out. So thunderstorms can actually produce more thunderstorms that way with these outflow boundaries. And that did. It produced a really wicked storm moving toward Noonan and Fayette County yesterday. So the thunderstorms can generate even more storms uh, as they move across the area. But again, this is our storm tracker to HD radar, and we are just minutes away from the beginning of Channel 2 Action News beginning at 4. I'll be back shortly. So looking at the radar this afternoon, we have some showers and some storms forming on it, and we are fortunate to have meteorologist Ebony Dion in Severe Weather Center 2 today doing the 5 o'clock news. Ebony, you're a great meteorologist, and tell me what's the most challenging thing that, about meteorology? Um, the most challenging thing is getting it right, especially when people are trying to plan their events and things like that. We do our best, and we have a lot of tools that really help us to um, get a pretty accurate forecast. But sometimes, especially this time of year when you have summertime storms and they pop up some of anywhere, people want to know, is it going to happen at my house? So sometimes that is a challenge, trying to pinpoint exact locations and things of that nature. But for the most part, um, just meteorology as a whole can be a challenge just because things are always changing. We're always learning and we're always finding out new things. So it is also rewarding in that aspect as well. Speaking of new things, how has the technology changed over the say last 10 or 20 years? Oh, wow. Um, technology has changed simply because now we do have more things that we can use. We have more tools in our toolbox. Um, the radar has actually gotten better. Um, our satellites, we've gotten more areas that we can see a little bit better. So just a lot of things over the last 10 years. I, I graduated in school years ago, <laughs> but since that time, things have certainly improved. What would you tell little girls this, this morning about meteorology that, that want to get into the field? 
I would say you can definitely do it. And um, I would also say that, um, you know, start off by looking at your surroundings. When you go outside, take a look at what's happening around you, make observations. And then in school, pay very close attention to math and science. Those are going to be your key core subjects and learning all about meteorology. And that's gonna be the backbone of really the science that you'll need to be successful in the career. All right, we're getting ready to go on. This is right seconds before the newscast. You'll hear the announcers come on and the anchors. My wardrobe has no green in it, by the way. Good afternoon. Glad you're here with us. I'm Linda Stouffer. Wendy Corona is off. I'm Justin Farmer. Major stories to cover here on this Tuesday, and let's get started talking about the CDC and a big change. And we'll get to that first, though. We're going to do storms again across North Georgia. Severe weather, Team 2. Warned you can see this kind of pattern. We've watched Storm Tracker 2 HD light up and our live cameras as the conditions keep changing outside. We get straight to Chief Meteorologist Glenn Burns tracking it all for us in Severe Weather Center 2. Glenn. Indeed. Now, lightning is not a criteria for strong or severe thunderstorms, but it is unbelievable out here, especially as we get into... See, that's what it looks like. It must look totally bizarre to a person inside the studio pointing at nothing. The last 10 minutes, 339 lightning strikes, 340 now. That's in the last 10 minutes, seven of those... But there's, there's the end result, me and a map. So that's, that's the way it, it is. That's the way it turns out. Uh, Halloween's, we have a lot of fun. When I do wear some green pants or something, we have the invisible weatherman walking around with no legs. We've done that actually on the air. So it's, it's a lot of fun, a lot of fun. So that's behind the scenes. So again, three minutes turns into about three hours of work. It is a lot of fun. I come into the office each and every day and I don't have papers to fill out. I don't have anything. Everything's brand new, exciting every day, and there's always a challenge. What's the weather going to be like today? What's this front going to do? Um, how many storms are we going to get? Where are they going to occur? Who's going to be hurt by them? And that is, when you're, when you're, when you're forecasting and you're, and you're in a hurricane mode, or you're in a tornado mode, and you know when you see the wind there that's 100 miles an hour and, and people are in the path of that, I know the terror that you must be facing. I mean, that's scary, absolutely scary. But we try to do the best we can to keep you calm and to keep everybody safe. So that is our primary goal, and I hope uh, we do that for you each and every day. Anybody have any questions about weather? And Before we start with we questions, uh, oh. we're going to bring up the lights just a little bit and so we can see everybody and uh, also I've got some uh, uh, folks that are gonna be passing out small pieces of of Glenn's birthday cake and um, if you if you have a survey we'd love to hear feedback from you and as a just a little extra incentive if you put your survey up on the basket on the stage uh, at the very end of questions We'll do a quick drawing for a free uh, t-shirt, uh, adult size t-shirts only is all we have, uh, but that's okay, they'll grow into it. Uh, but uh, uh, we'll do a drawing for a Telus t-shirt. So um, anyway, let me get up over here, and did, if I you have a sleep. question, raise your hand, and I will repeat the question to Glenn, because we're recording this, and I see a gentleman right here with a question. Yes. Uh, somebody that does the graphics like Maya, how many people do you have that do that? Is, it, is there three people, five people? How many people that produce our graphics? 
Uh, we have one, that is Maya, and she produces the graphics for uh, when we have a normal situation, that would be me, meteorologist Brad Nitz, and Ebony Dion of the Weather Center. So she would produce the graphics for each of us. Uh, it's very time consuming, very elaborate, and really has to be spot on. So she, Maya does an excellent, excellent job with that. Okay, I have a young man right over here. Um, how do you know where you're pointing on the screen? That is an excellent question. How do I know where, I, where do I point on the screen? Well, in the green screen, let's pretend this is the green screen. I have a TV here, TV here, here, and here. But you can't see it, so I have to watch myself point to something that's not really there. <laughs> yes. So I watch myself on TV like you would at home. Okay, young lady with a question right over here. What is a microburst? Oh, a microburst, one of my favorite things to watch, not to be under. Now, the end of a thunderstorm. A thunderstorm in a typical summertime thunderstorm lasts about an hour. When it begins, it's fed by air that's rising from the ground, hot air billowing up and getting higher and higher and higher until it forms thunderstorm clouds, eventually rain. Now, rain comes from where it's very cold up in the atmosphere. So as the rain falls through the thunderstorm, those updrafts of warm air become overwhelmed by the, the, by the cold air that's coming down from the rain. So when the air gets cold enough, it can sometimes drop down to the middle of a storm as a microburst. All right, young man has a question right here. Um, what's the worst storm you guys have had? The worst storm I've ever been in? It was uh, back in 1993. It was the blizzard of 93. Anybody remember that one? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you that story. So I was looking at the weather models, and uh, our American models were, yeah, we could see five, six inches of snow. And I said, I don't like that at all. Uh, the European model was showing about 15 inches of snow. And I still thought that was an underestimation. Now, the other TV stations went with that. I went to my boss and I said, well, here's the deal. Because I went to my newsroom meeting and he said, how much snow do you think you're going to get? I said, I think we could get at least 30 inches. He goes, no, really? I said, yeah, I think we could get about 30 inches of snow. The, here's the water values in the atmosphere. It's cold. We're going to have an outbreak of severe storms ahead of this. Behind it is some really cold air. I said, this is a full-fledged blizzard. He said, well, you're not going to go on the air and say that. So, well, guts, no guts, no glory, right? So I went on the air, and I said, 30 inches of snow. The people were saying, you're crazy. That's not ever going to happen. It's never happened before. And 36 inches of snow later, they were riding on horseback up on the North Georgia mountains to get around. Uh, down here in Adairsville in Bartow County, uh, we had uh, anywhere from about 15 to 20 inches of snow. But yeah, it was, uh, it was an amazing thing. And, and that was the scariest one because it had all modes of weather, severe storms, cold, blizzard, that was the most impactful. Okay, young man has a question right here. Who controls the tornado sirens? What was that? Who controls the tornado sirens? Who controls the tornado sirens? That is the job of the government. And I'm not really, I don't like tornado sirens, and I'll tell you why. Um, yes, give her the microphone for one second. People rely on tornado sirens yes, too much. Yes, but what did you hear? You had a tornado come near your house, a brief spin-up tornado. What did it sound like? I heard the train noise, and it honestly sounded like a big wave coming toward our house, and it wasn't until the wind stopped, and about five minutes later, the tornado sirens went off, and our neighborhood had already been hit. There you go. Uh, you're, you're, the sound of a tornado is unbelievable. You will never forget it once you hear it. That sound overwhelms a tornado siren. You can't hear it unless you're, like for me to Dave, 
you can't hear the tornado sirens. So that's what scares me about them. Don't rely on the tornado sirens. And in her case, it was after the fact that it sounded. Young man with a question here. How do you know you wanted to be a meteorologist? <laughs> that is an excellent question, young man. What is your name? Brock. Brock. All right. I grew up in a place called Fort Lauderdale, Florida. <laughs> I'm a Florida Gator. Excellent. You get bigger pieces of cake. <laughs> I was 11 years old. My mom said, you're not going to go to the beach today because it looks like some storms are coming. So naturally, I went. <laughs> um, there was a storm that came up by the beach. There was a water spout. I was in high school, and I was invincible. And we used to, as kids, wait for the water spouts to come up close to shore, and we would jump into them. Yeah. It was like a 40, 50 mile an hour wind. You get a little sand blast there, but it was fun. On this day, there happened to be a lightning bolt that went with it. And it was the lightning and boom at that instant. And the shock wave from it, it was so close, knocked me to the ground. From that point on, I wanted to learn everything I could about lightning and everything I could about meteorology. I love space science, I love astrophysics. That was my passion, but lightning just got to me. You know, being nearly just knocked over by the, by the, by the uh, concussion of the shock wave, that had me hooked. So that's what got me into it. That was okay. a good question. Young man has a question right here. I wouldn't recommend doing it that way, however. How did tornadoes start? How do tornadoes start? That is an excellent question. Now, in the spring, that's when we have one tornado season, but we also have another tornado season in the fall. So when we have fronts that are coming in, we have a northwesterly wind coming in, but ahead of the front is a southwesterly wind. And they can kind of meet up. And where you have some, what's called vorticity, when they meet up, they can kind of spin. And if there's enough spin in that atmosphere, you can see the tornado. It's a very complicated process. I've chased tornadoes before. It is a lot of fun to do until you get really close. And then you really get scared. I mean, they're unbelievable creatures of nature. OK, I'm going to take this over here to this young lady right here. What would happen if two tornadoes were really close together? What would happen if two tornadoes got really close together? Oh, that is an excellent question. Come here. Come here. I love this question. Come on up. Oh, is that your sister? Come on up. What is your name? Taylor. Taylor. And you? I remember you. Ashley. So, we have two tornadoes. <laughs> one here and one here. So they're coming close together. They will never ever meet. There are two areas of low pressure that repel each other and they do a dance. And they hit each other and they will spin around like this. And one will go one way and another the other. But they'll spin. And a guy named uh, Mr. Fujiwara he found this out, and he named it after himself, the Fujiwara Effect. Two tornadoes can never touch each other. They will repel each other and spin around in a dance. And that's called the Fujiwara Effect. Thank you, girls. Very good. All right, have a young man right over here. OK. How many hurricanes did you witness? I witness, be in or witness? How many hurricanes did you got hit? <laughs> Have you seen? I grew up in South Florida, so a lot. <laughs> um, my first one that I really understood was uh, Hurricane Donna that hit Miami. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. My parents were freaking out, but I loved it. Um, so I've been in about. I'd say at least 10, 
and then I'd flown into the eye of a hurricane on a hurricane hunter. Now, a hurricane hunter aircraft looks like a submarine with wings. The pilots are from the Air Force. They're not too well. <laughs> they fly right into the middle of the storm, but they don't go over the top of it because you can't, because those storm clouds are going over 60,000 feet in the atmosphere. And these are planes, not jets. They're planes with propellers and wings. And if you've ever been to Six Flags, it's the best Six Flag ride there is. I mean, you, you'll hit the storm, you go into the side of it, and there are updrafts that go in the storm that are going up more than 100 miles an hour. So you hit that and the plane will go, boom! And boy, just do not eat lunch before you go. Uh, but you'll get the ride of your life. So I've been with the Hurricane Hunters. And then the strangest thing happens where you're flying along, and then all of a sudden, boom! You break into the eye of the storm. And the sun's out. Birds, I've seen seagulls flying in the eye of a hurricane. Absolutely amazing. And then they drop parachutes called drop wind sounds down the middle of the hurricane to determine the pressure of the storm. If the pressure's decreasing, that means the storm is weakening, uh, or rather strengthening. If the pressure's increasing, that means the storm is what we call filling. That means getting weaker. So the hurricane hunters do a great job of, of flying into the eye of a storm. I mean, it's the best six flag ride you could ever imagine. All right, let's have a question over here. Yes. My question deals with flooding. Uh, are there any particular models that are used for, uh, for issuing a, a warning or a watch for a flood? Yes, we have several computer models that do that. Again, our European model is the best one that shows what's called a precipitable water. And that if you took a column of air and you took all the water out of it, then you'd see how much water would be forming on the ground. So again, that's what the National Weather Service uses to issue flood watches and warnings across the area. But again, yeah. We have a question from our online audience wanting to oh, know yes. how weather patterns uh, affect astroimagers and maybe even astronomers in general. You mean like when we have the clouds that roll in just in time for the eclipse? Yeah, that one. That has happened too, yeah. Um, how would I go about that, Dave? Well, basically, if there's weather, we're usually in trouble. That's basically the bottom line, of, yeah, and we've seen that time and time again. Um, the planetarium is an amazing thing to have, uh, wonderful here, but it's all dependent on weather, and you know, it's just the luck of the draw. All right, let me have a question right over here. Um, is there any coding in meteorology? Any coding. Is that like computer coding? Computer coding in meteorology. Lots and lots. Fortunately, I don't have to do any of it. It's done by a supercomputer. And the models are issued every six hours, and the supercomputer takes six hours and crunches the entire atmosphere into little ones and zeros. Uh, so it's an amazing process that goes on. But again, I'm glad I don't have to do that. Okay, I got a young man with a question right here. Has a tornado ever formed in a convective snow squall or a snow squall supercell? All the time, absolutely all the time. A convective storm will produce a tornado. Um, you have a lot of wind shear going on even in the winter time. So that's what I said, we had two tornado seasons, one of the fall and early winter along with the spring and the summer season, so yeah. Okay, I have another question right here. What has been your most difficult college course you have taken? Synoptics. Synoptic meteorology. Just a lot of busy work. A lot of busy work. Okay. I'm going to come right way back <coughs> over here. Young man has a question right here. <coughs> What's a straight line wind? What is a straight line wind? Okay, that's an excellent question. What is your name? You should be a meteorologist. What is a straight line wind? That's Nathan. Good job, Nathan. All right, in a thunderstorm, you have air that's going up in the updrafts, but also air that's going down. So the colder the air is, 
the faster it goes. And when it hits the ground, it slams into the ground and fans out. And that's that big rush of cold air that comes in with the gust front there. All right, and we have time for one last question. And this young man right here. What's it like to be in a tornado? <laughs> What's it like to be in a tornado? Um, a lot of stuff. It's hard to explain. Very windy. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, I want to thank all of you for being here today. It's been such an honor to have so many wonderful folks here at the museum. Please turn in your, um, your surveys on the basket, and in about five minutes, I'll, I'll do a drawing for a free T-shirt. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you very much. And please much. thank Glenn.